Holy Spirit is still what I want to talk about, the fruit, you know, this resurrection fruit, which is the Holy Spirit. You know, that's just one part of the fruit of resurrection. It's incredible. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm already stumbling over my words because it's just somehow, someway, we've got to actually wake up to what we have available as far as how to yield to the Holy Spirit, how to be led by the Holy Spirit. I mean, these, we quote these verses forever, but God help us really actually comprehend what it is. Anyhow, uh, I'll just tell once again a story. She would have people go into trances, and uh, they would stand like statues, if you've heard about it. They'd just stop and stand like statues like this. And, you know, for 12 hours, in one case, one woman for three days, a woman was sharing a little bit of a testimony, and she stopped. And for three full days, she was stuck like that. No bodily functions, no anything. She comes out of it, and she starts right where she left off. Incredible. But literally, in her ministry, I talk about, you know, when a bomb goes off, you know how there's often there's, there's the blast point, but then there's collateral damage. When the Spirit of God would fall, remember one of the basics about the Spirit of God is that while he's in all of us, he's not upon all of us, and yet he can be upon all of us. And that's one of our prayers, we, Holy Spirit, we want, we want you to come upon us so this stuff happens. But when the Spirit of God would come upon her, this blast, there was collateral blessing 20 miles away. Wow. Villages 20 miles away, people just suddenly fell, in, fell off, you know, just fell down at their, on their face, started crying out to God. Over and over again, this would happen where whole villages, whole cities were just transformed by the bomb that went off in her <laughs> meeting. Hallelujah. You know, I welcome a glory bomb here. A friend of mine, did, all those years ago, he said, I got really upset about that. What was that? An old song. Mercy drops around us are falling, but, but, but for the showers we plead. So he changed the song and said, mercy drops. He said, you know, mercy drops. That's not God. God's pretty big. So he said, glory bombs around us are falling. Turn to Genesis 1. I want to talk about the Holy Spirit. I want to talk a little bit about tongues because I can't help myself. Um, talk about the real blessing. But I'm just, let's just look. I'm just going to go back to Rod Anderson Bible teaching this morning. So just whatever. We'll see what happens. In Genesis 1, let me read from verse 1. Can any of you, do you need help finding Genesis? Okay. Steve, you got it? You got it? You're looking. Okay. Just type it in. Type it in on your iPad. And I read from the Amplified Bible, of course, which is what most wise men read, as opposed to others who. In the beginning, God prepared. He formed, he fashioned, and he created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form, an empty waste. Darkness was upon the face of the very great deep. The Spirit of God was moving, hovering, brooding over the face of the waters. And the first point I want to make is, and I don't want us to fight over words or language, but sometimes, you know, we'll say about a meeting, a particular meeting, no thanks, Brian, I don't need any water. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. I love making people feel comfortable. Cheers to the queen. But you know how we'll say in our meeting sometimes, and I don't argue with me about this because Steve will answer you, but you know how we'll say the Spirit of God was really moving last night. I would like to suggest to you that the Spirit of God is always moving. He never stops moving. And I want you to see this. When you actually look at verse 2, it says, you know, there was nothing there. The earth was without form. It was an empty waste. Darkness is upon the face of the very great deep. The Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. Verse 3, and God said, let there be light. And what happened? There was light. Now turn to Isaiah 34 real quick. Like I said, I'm going to try to really move because I gotta, I'm just trusting I can get some of this stuff out of me. Hallelujah. Because I want to, you know, it's, it's, in my 
experience with God. All I know is that if something happens with me more, it's not that you have to understand, but understanding helps you be more involved in stuff. I don't know how to say it. It's like if, if I have, I'm going to try to take a, an eight-hour teaching about tongues and put it down into this session. So give me the benefit of the doubt. There's a whole lot of stuff about this that to me is absolutely crucial. It just It's one of my great frustrations that I don't understand why people in the body of Christ don't really catch on it. Anyhow, verse 16, Isaiah 34, 16, we know the verse, but I want you to just catch this. Seek out of the book of the Lord and read. Not one of these details of prophecy shall fail. None shall want and lack her mate in the fulfillment. For the mouth of the Lord has commanded, and his spirit hath gathered them. Now, what I want you to see is all the way back in Genesis 1, there was no creation yet. The spirit of, the spirit of God was moving, hovering, brooding. But there was no creation. But when God said something, I want you to see how he works. The spirit of God gathered those words. He gathered God's word and used it as the fuel to create light. Wait, no, wait, you got to catch that. The mouth of the Lord commanded, and his spirit it hath gathered him. The spirit of God gathers and is the creative element of the Godhead, of the Trinity. He is the one that brings actual form, substance, creation to bear in our lives. So we need to understand this about the spirit of God, and we need to understand this is why, again, the decrees and the declarations are really important because that's what gives him Something to work with. In other words, when you say, let, you know, God said, let there be light. The Spirit of God grabbed those hmm, that's three words. Let's do it. <laughs> Boom, and there was light. Hallelujah. This is why, again, you begin to declare, decree your healing, what have you. The Spirit of God has something to work with. Amen? Just stay with me there, okay? Super simple, right? Say yes, anyhow. Okay, God help me. Now turn to John 7. Again, these are all familiar, but I'm... By the time I get to what I'm trying to get to, hopefully we'll see it better. Um, sorry, I can't get the pages to turn quick enough. In John 7, of course, we know Jesus is speaking here, and it says in verse 35, Then the Jews said among themselves, this is John 7, 35, Then the Jews said among themselves, Where does this man intend to go that we shall not find him? Will he go to the Jews who are scattered in the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does this statement of his mean? You will look for me and not be able to find me. And where I am, you cannot come. Now, on the final and the most important day of the feast, Jesus stood and he cried in a loud voice, If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, from his innermost being shall flow continuously springs and rivers of living water. Right? Now, did he say that or not? Out of your belly shall flow rivers. Say rivers. Rivers of living water. But what verse 39 say? But he was speaking here of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were afterward to receive, but the Holy Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So let's just, I just want to settle the foundation. Jesus Christ said that something was going to happen. He said, when you believe on him, he said, out of your belly, he said, in the middle of the Jews asking him this question, he said, out of your belly there's going to flow rivers of living water. Again, we've quoted that for so long, we don't stop and consider it. Out of your belly, your innermost being, there's going to be a flow. Now, again, <laughs> there's going to be a flow of living water. Out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. Now, please just, again, agree with the, the most simple of truth. Hear me. Where water is, life can come. Right? Right? This is, you know, so deep that we need deep, deep. <laughs> no. Where water is, there's life. Right? 
out of your belly flow, will flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit. So we know that the guy, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, right? Just say amen. Okay. Okay, John 14. Again. Now, John 14, again, uh, I love when I teach at the Love Walk, I always start with John 13. John 13, uh, 1. I'll read John 13, 1 real quickly. Now, before the Passover feast began, Jesus knew. He was fully aware that the time had come for him to leave this world and return to the Father. In other words, it says this, he was fully aware. Everything that Jesus speaks in the next few chapters, his mind is pregnant with the absolute revelation, I'm about to go. I'm about to leave. And particularly the 13th chapter, it says having loved them, I mean the rest of the verse says having loved them, he loved them to the last and to the highest degree. And then he goes on to show, and evidently, the example. The, he said, this is the example I give unto you. When you call me Master and Lord, and you're right in saying this, that's, that's who I am. But he said, if I, your Master and Lord, wash your feet, it is your duty. You are under God obligation to wash one another's feet. And he, it's amazing to me. In other words, if you call your 12 disciples, the guys that are going to carry forward whatever heaven's mission is, my God, he's about to delegate this to these guys, and he wants them to know the heartbeat of what real Jesus ministry looks like. And he said, and the, you know, and I've got to be careful I don't go there. And the, the, the example, he did not tell them how to raise the dead. He didn't tell them about prayer. He didn't tell them about anything. He washes their feet. And he said, do you understand what I've just done? That's what, the, that's the crucial foundation of all, you know, legitimate ministry. You got to, it's about serving people. It's about Serving people and understanding what that means and having a heart of humility where it's no big deal for you to bow on your knee. And particularly in Jesus' case, Jesus possibly was pretty anointed. Anybody agree with that? And the thing is, it's one thing I learned along the way is you have to learn sometimes, even if you carry a stronger grace or stronger anointing of some people, God still expects you. Often you'll, have to, you'll find yourself along the way bowing your knee to others who, quite frankly, and with all humility, I say this, they don't carry as much as you do. But the issue isn't how much you carry. It is, I mean, not to try to go against the statement we made the other day, but what I'm trying to get at is just, you know, I'm, you, you need to be willing to serve whosoever makes no difference, you know. In other words, you never get too big that you, can't, that you don't serve, that you don't remember who we are, that he's our king. But nevertheless, John 13, there's, it, there's, there's 21 chapters in the book of John. John 13, the next seven, eight chapters, everything that happens happens in the last three days of his life and his resurrection. And so this is some of the most important stuff he's trying to communicate to his disciples. This is leadership stuff. This is the most important stuff. I'm about to go. Jesus, knowing fully he was about to leave. And the word there, no, is this word that speaks of this absolute intimacy, and it speaks of the intimacy between a husband and a wife. The word is actually intercourse, so don't get mad at me. It speaks about something that calls, causes impregnation. It causes, I mean, it's absolute intimacy. And this is, the, again, his mind was just full of the fact, I'm about to go. And so he goes on, and he begins to share all these incredible truths. And he goes through John 13 and talks about the love and new commandment I give you. But then in John 14, I know you know these verses, so don't start throwing stones at me. But I just want you to see it in context. If it's some, if if he, all of this is because I'm I'm about to leave, and how I mean, how often does he talk about the Holy Spirit? You know, in John 14, 15, and 16. But John 14, let's just start there real quickly. I mean, I'm going to read quickly. Like I said, John 14, 21 says, "The person who has my commands and keeps them is the one who really loves me." And whoever really loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him, and I will show, I will reveal, I will manifest myself to him. I will let myself be clearly seen by him and make myself real to him. I could, I'd love to go off there, but that's not for another time. Judas, not, a, not Iscariot, asked him, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself, make yourself real to us and not to the world? Jesus answered, if a person really loves me, he will keep my word. He'll obey my teaching. And my Father will love him. And we 
Jesus and Father, will come to him and make a home. In other words, we're talking about not somebody visiting, but somebody taking up residence. And that's what we long for. And we will come to him and make our home, our abode, our special dwelling place with him. Anyone who does not really love me does not observe and obey my teaching. And the teaching which you hear and heed is not mine, but it comes from the Father who sent me. I have told you these things while I'm still with you. Here he starts again. But the comforter, and here, you know, we get these, the sevenfold spirit of God, you know, the seven. But the comforter, the counselor, the helper, the intercessor, the advocate, the strengthener, the standby, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, in my place, to represent me and act on my behalf, he will teach you all things, and he will cause you to recall, will remind you of, bring to your remembrance everything I have told you. Now, I've learned long ago to, you know, and when we read these next few verses, whatever he said the Holy Spirit has come to do, again, I have to release faith for that. In Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, bring up into my remembrance anything and everything I need to know when I speak at this meeting. Whatever I've studied over 20 years, 30 years, if there's any, if whatever, Holy Spirit, you know everything that the Father knows and that Jesus taught. Bring up into my remembrance in Jesus' name. I, I'm asking you, so I'm, I, I release faith for you to do that. John 15, start at verse... Um, gosh, start at verse, um, well, I can start at verse 20. I got to put back. Jesus said, remember that I told you, a servant is not greater than his master, is not superior, superior to him. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they keep my word and obey my teaching, they will also keep and obey yours. But they will do all this to you. They will inflict all this suffering on you because of your bearing my name and on my account, for they do not know or understand the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. They'd be blameless. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me also hates the Father. If I had not done, accomplished among them the works which no one else ever did, they would not be guilty of sin. But the fact is, now they have both seen these works and have hated both me and my Father. But this is so that the word written in the law might be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But I just want you to see the constant emphasis. But when the comforter, the counselor, the helper, the advocate, the intercessor, the strengthener, the standby comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth, who comes and proceeds from the Father, he himself will testify regarding me. Okay? Now, again, uh, it's Christianity 101, I know, but out of your belly. He speaks of the Spirit, but just speak to you of the Spirit. So everybody just humor me. Pat your tummy. Pat your belly. Some of you aren't patting your belly. Pat your belly, Charlie. God's, it do, has, do we, do we all agree, do we all have enough Christian knowledge to know that God's Holy Spirit, what the Bible teaches, he has come to dwell in us. Is that right? Is that right? We're all born of the Holy Spirit. If you're born again, you're born of the Holy Spirit. But we know because of what Acts says, Acts 1, Acts 3, Acts 5, Acts 9, Acts 13, we know that there is a secondary experience called we call being filled with the Holy Spirit, right? You're born of the Spirit, so you have the Spirit in by measure. But the baptism, the immersion of the Holy Spirit comes when, again, you release faith for it or you find yourself in a place where it happens. Like in my case, it just, I'm telling I was in the middle of a thing called a, um, uh, a praise night and teen challenge, and just this thing just, boom, hit me. A guy was singing and singing this old, Christian song, Stephen, I was just singing, sometimes hallelujah, sometimes pray. I don't know, you know, I don't, you know forgive my rugged, ugly, bacon sort of voice. But that old, he was just singing, sometimes hallelujah, sometimes praise the Lord. And it just, bam, man, it was stuff just hit me. So nobody laid hands on me or anything. But a lot of, but you know, you can get it by, whatever. I got baptized in the Holy Ghost, and it was a whole nother experience from just being born again. 
Amen. Anyhow, so I just want to see. So John 15, he says again that what the Holy Spirit's going to do is what? He's going to testify about me. He's the spirit of truth. There's no error in him. He lives in Rod. He's, he lives in me. The spirit of truth lives in me. So see, truth is here. But the issue is how do I bring it up? The issue is how do I cooperate with what God has done by his grace? John 16, and this is where again we find this incredible statement to these. Steve says it a million times better than I do, but you know, you consider what the disciples must have what must have been going through their mind. You know, when, you know, they're, they're watching all this happen and, you know, everybody around about them, they think that the, a king is coming that's going to eradicate Roman rule and everything. But in John 16, I'm going to start at verse 1. I have told you all these things so that you should not be offended, taken unawares or falter or be caused to stumble and fall away. I told you to keep you from being scandalized and repelled. They will put you out and they'll expel you from the synagogue. But an hour is coming. You think that's something. In other words, an hour is coming when whosoever, whoever kills you will think and claim they've offered service to God. Again, you know, I'm not, my specialty isn't end times, isn't an eschatology, but I've got to tell you, you know, we, we, anybody with half a brain knows we're racing towards that now, especially in Europe. You know, you, you're already in situ. Well, it's happened in America, too. You know, if we talk, if we say anything against homosexuality, if we say, you know what I mean, if we say anything about it, you know, boom, your license is away. And they're already trying in America, you know, one of the major issues of this election is of what will proceed if the wrong person gets in. They're already talking about, you know, taking away all the nonprofit statuses from churches, from Christian churches and stuff like that. In other words, it's going to hit our finances, it's going to hit all kinds of things. And again, the issue is if you begin to just speak what God's word says, if you quote Romans 1, you'll be thrown in jail. But it gets, it's going to get, you know, it's hard for people to realize, but we actually are upon, we're at this time. We really are. We really are at this time. I don't know if you ever over here get a program called Dr. Oz, O-Z, O-Z, excuse me, over here you pronounce Z-Z. But, and, you know, they're, there's a, they're talking about all Switzerland and Sweden again. Switzerland, I'm sorry, and whatever there, I can't remember the other nation. But anyhow, the, the, how these businesses uh, that have three and 4,000 people have in, introduced the chip into the hand because, again, absolute identification. And they're all talking about how incredible it is because, you know, if say, say something happens to you, you have an illness or something, you know, that on this chip, all of your past medical history is right there. So if you come in the hospital, all they have to do is scan and they can, a doctor can save your lives because you'll have all this information, boom, right there. And of course, terrorism, why my gosh, we'll have absolute, abs absolute identificational clarity by virtue of this, because your DNA is actually something that's part that will be reflected in the actual chip. And so that's many, many big companies in Europe, they're already doing this just for security reasons, uh, these guys that deal with a lot of information. So again, you don't understand how fast stuff is happening right now. I mean, it really is incredibly fast. But see, we don't have to fear because of this right here. The Holy Spirit, God's God's spirit has come to live on the inside of us. I mean, you know, I, I have told you all these things so that you should not be offended. Now, let me get down. Then verse 3, and they will do this because they have not known the Father or me. Verse 4, but I have told you these things now so that when they occur, you will remember that I told you of them. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts, taking complete possession of you. I mean, he said, you know, I'm telling, I'm leaving. All this is going to happen, and they're beginning to freak out, right? I mean, seriously, you, you really have to, you have to understand, their whole world is being shaken. I mean, it's, it's done. But you have to understand, see, we're coming to a point right now where all of the stuff that we quote but never have seen to the, its fullness yet is happening. You know, all things that will be shaken so that that cannot be shaken will remain. We're there. And if we, if you really begin to see it, let me tell you, if you really, be, you know, it, this is why, thing, you've got to read the Bible every day, man. You've got you to have a prayer life because otherwise all the, you know, the bad news will suffocate you. 
And that's what it does. It suffocates. It takes the life out of you. So you have to keep going back to the spring where the life comes from. And here is a situation that happened prophetically, and it's, it's like we call it the law of double reference in Bible colleges where it's, you have this immediate reference, but it also speaks of a time to come. He said, but because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. However, and wonderful, thank God, and I love verse 7 in the Amplified Bible. I am telling you nothing but the truth when I say it's profitable. It's good. It's expedient. It's advantageous for you that I go away. Because if I do not go away, the comforter, the counselor, the helper, the advocate, the intercessor, the strengthener, the standby will not, and I love to amplify for this, it says will not come to you into close fellowship with you. I did a whole series on the word close. Close fellowship. There's fellowship, my friend. But then there's something beyond that. <clears throat> Again, it's Pastor Steve. He's speaking from another dimension, a dimension I, I, would, I, would, I, I believe I could say with all accuracy, 99% of all churches, I believe 99% of the churches in the whole world do not have somebody speaking to them from the dimension that Steve speaks from. Seriously. Seriously. And this is why, you know, it's... They're just doing talks. Now, I'm not judging, but it's just an objective ob observation. You go in there, they're doing talks, and they do some, when there's some wonderful guys that are, there's incredible preachers out there, and blah, 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 and they get you stirred up and whatever this, but, but there's just, there's a real difference between that and actually understanding how to access heaven and all access pass, like at a concert. That's what we get with the, with the blood of Christ and with the Holy Ghost. But imagine them hearing, it's going to be better for you when I'm gone, guys. Now, they've walked with him for three and a half years. And I, I always love quoting the very last verse of John 21. It's that verse that says, had we actually, now think about this. I mean, I don't know if you believe the Bible's true or not. Anybody believe possibly the Bible's true? <laughs> but think about the last verse of John 21. Had we written, all the things that we'd witnessed. Think about John penning this. Had we written down all the things that we witnessed, I do not suppose that the world itself would be able to contain the volumes therein. <laughs> Think of the hugest libraries in the world. They saw and witnessed so very much. And But what we have in the four Gospels is like, this is why you have to understand, it's the tip of the iceberg. It's patterns and principles that you see, you begin to, when you walk with the Lord, you begin to see deeper and deeper and deeper into these things that had to have happened because it was his nature. You begin to see. But again, so here he looks at him and he says, it's going to be better for you when I'm gone. And they're going, oh, yeah. you know, you're the guy that does the stuff. But see, but he's trying to tell them, no, it wasn't me. <laughs> that does the stuff. I'm leaving you with the guy. I'm not going to leave without you being sent the same one that's in me. Remember John saw the Spirit of God come and rest upon him like a dove on him. Remember that everything that Jesus Christ did, I've taught this here before, but it's a simple little truth that's still phenomenal in the study of the Bible. Remember, um, every time you see the word Jesus before Christ, it speaks of his humanity. And, but how many of you know there's many scriptures that have Christ before Jesus? When, Christ, when it speaks of Christ Jesus, it's speaking of his divinity. When it speaks of Jesus Christ, it speaks of his humanity. And the wonderful thing you begin to see is there's not one miracle in the four Gospels that, were, that was done by Christ Jesus. Every miracle was done by Jesus Christ. In other words, the wonder one of the greatest things to actually come alive to is to understand that every single miracle is worked by a man full of the Holy Ghost. 
In other words, he had, and it, the flat, scripture flat says, he had no other, he didn't have any privileges that we don't have. Did you really hear that? But this absolute Awareness about a yield. Yield is a giant word in Scripture. Yield remembers his servants to righteousness. Yeah. But he, he, he knew how to yield. So he said, I'm, I'm telling you nothing but the truth when I say it's profitable because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter won't come into close fellowship. It's a whole other thing, close fellowship. Then he goes on down, and he says in verse 8, he said, when he comes, the Holy Spirit, and this is, again, some basic stuff that he says what he will do. He will convict and convince the world. The Holy Spirit in us and any ministry that is really of the Holy Spirit will bring conviction to the world and bring demonstration to it about sin, about righteousness of heart, uprightness of heart and right standing with God and about judgment. The Holy Spirit's going to bring conviction of sin because they don't believe in him. It's going to bring conviction about righteousness uprightness of heart because I go to my father and you won't see me any longer. In other words, he's going to convince and display what right standing looks like. And he's also going to bring uh, demonstration about judgment because the ruler, the evil genius, the prince of this world, Satan, is judged and condemned and sentenced past, already is passed upon him. I have still many things to say to you, but you're not able to bear them or take them upon you or grasp them now. But, amen, when he, the spirit of truth, the truth-giving spirit comes, he will guide you into all the truth, the whole full truth. So release your faith with that Holy Spirit. Guide me into the truth about this matter. When you're, when you're counseling people, when Jimmy and I are counseling people, I mean, I don't ever speak to people about first take, and I just take five, you just, you have your own methods, but I'll just take like three or four or five minutes, and I'll just stop. Sometimes I excuse myself and go to the toilet. I'll just sit there on the loo, not because I have to use the toilet, but I just have to get away and, as it were, recenter myself and just say, Spirit of God, okay, guide me into truth right now. And I know that you're the revelator, and that's another huge thing. He's the one that brings, he's the one that reveals. He reveals, he reveals. But, and so release faith to that. Anyhow, but when he, the spirit of truth, the truth-giving spirit comes, he will guide you into the truth, the whole full truth. For he will not speak his own message on his own authority, but he will tell whatever he hears from the Father. He will give the message that has been given to him, and he will announce and he will declare to you the things that are to come that will happen in the future. He will honor and glorify me because he will take up, receive, and draw upon what is mine. And you know what he's going to do? He will reveal, declare, disclose, and transmit it to you. And I love the fact that the put, and I've shared this here again, uh, but I'm going to share it again, again. But, you know, it's one, it's one of the most basic illustrations, but to me it's just still so powerful. He will transmit everything of heaven to us. Here's the old illustration. Are there radio waves in this room? Do you hear them? Why? Why don't you hear them? Are there television signals in the very room that we're sitting in? And, but but we, we didn't catch that. There's stuff in the air right now, and we don't know the, most of us don't have the science to explain how that can be true, that there's something right here in the air. I mean, you've got a phone in your pocket now. You've got something right there that can communicate with somebody 7,000 miles away. There's signals in here. There's all kinds of information in the air. But the only way you discover what it is is you have to to have a receiver. And then like in the old days when I grew up, my dad had one of these old Philco radios, you know, one of those things that stood about 15 foot tall, <laughs> you know, like this. And on Saturday morning as a kid, you know, tune, tune it. You know. But again, please just hear how it is. The Holy Spirit is always on his, on his job. 
he's faithful. You don't have to worry about the power of this transmitter. This is, he is transmitting truth all day long. It's right here. But you have to tune in. You have to learn to receive it. Again, it's so basic, see, and I, I fight my frustration because I know this church, you know, you guys are advanced, but still, I get really frustrated, and I want you to take the step outward. So that's what he does, right? Hallelujah. Now, and turn to 1 Corinthians 12. I don't know if I want to read that today or not. I may take a letter, but turn there anyhow if you wouldn't mind. 1 Corinthians 12. Now, we know I could go to Romans 8. talks about the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, right? Right? And again, that's another tool. What he does, he is the one who bears witness with our spirit. The Holy Spirit resides, as it were. What the Bible teaches, he lives in our spirit. Or they live right next door to each other. Whatever. He's in you. Okay. And in 1 Corinthians 12, you know, when we talk about uh, the, where Paul speaks about the gifts of the spirit, um, in verse 7, I just want you to catch this one part because, again, I, I, like I said, I'm trying to cram six or eight hours of stuff. I'm just trying to give you the headlines because I know that you're going to all be like Acts 17 says, Acts 17, 11. You're going to be more noble than those in, Thess in Thessalonica and that you're going to receive the word with readiness in mind, but you're going to search the scriptures whether these things be so or not. In other words, my job is to put it out there. It's your job to see if it's there. <laughs> but... Verse 7, but to each one, and up, you know, in the middle, Paul talking about the gift, but to each one is given the manifestation, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. See, again, the earth was without form and void. There was no manifestation until God's words was spoken. And then the Holy Spirit gathered those words. But here it says the manifestation. I want you to see another aspect. The manifestation, well, let me just read it. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, the evidence, the spiritual illumination of the Spirit for good and profit. Now, I, I, when I used to do tons of word studies, the word for manifestation there is phaneros. It's spelled P-H-A-N-E-R-O-S. And it speaks of light, illumination. But the thing that struck me, I'm not, I can't remember the lexicon, but it says the word always speaks. There's different. There's phaneros and there's phanera, just fane, F-A-N-E-O, which speaks of just light. But anyhow, it always, it says it always speaks to spontaneity. And why that ministered to me is because, again, the Holy Spirit, he manifests truth. He'll manifest wisdom. He'll manifest something. But the manifest, well, that word means this. Look at it. It means this. It means a flash, poof, poof, uh, poof. You see something, you hear something. It's a, it's a bam. It's a something that happens just, and this is why, again, I mean, you know, think about being, as many as are led of the spirit, they are the sons of God. The word there, Greek for sons, is weos, H-U-I-O-S, and it speaks of mature or adult sons. In other words, and it gets tough because people mishear me sometimes. While we're all children of God, we may not all be sons of God. There's different levels of maturity. To be a son of God, you're a person who's led by the Spirit. It means you've learned to yield. You've listened. You've learned to be quiet. You've got to learn the science of quiet. You've got to learn to listen. Listening is one of the greatest art forms there is on the planet. And you learn to you, to follow, like Paul says, the, the Spirit prompted me. There's a prompt, and it speaks of like an orchestra conductor, conductor that goes, he just prompts you. But one of the things I love, it says many are led by the Spirit. And literally, the Greek word for Spirit is what? It's pneuma, like for pneumatic, for air. And it literally it just says a puff of air. And I remember sitting back thinking about, if I'm going to be mature, I'm going to have to be led by this. I mean, how easy is it to miss? But this is why, again, see, the power of God is the power of God, and it's not available to just anybody because they'll kill people with it. You have to be, you have to exercise yourself towards the godliness. 
you have to get to the place where you actually <laughs> you learn how to recognize these promptings. It's a prompt. It doesn't come from the head. See, this is why our greatest enemy is our intellect sometimes. For me, you know, I was a chemistry minor in college, and I was always taught a scientific method of thought. Analyze, 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 analyze. And for years, I analyzed myself out of intimacy with Christ. I, I analyzed myself out of power because I've always trying to, you know, because you think about it, the whole world system of education is you are rewarded for your ability to logistically consider what a situation is and come up with a solution, right? Right? You know, you're rewarded for your ability to think something through. And yet we come to God and he says, lean not to your own understanding. You say, thank you very much, God. You know, he gave me this brain. But again, this is where the brain or the mind has to get renewed to God. Oh, hallelujah. Is anybody still here? I hope I'm not putting you to sleep in the first thing. But so we have to catch this. How many of you remember at school? You remember at school when you had multiple choice questions? And my teachers used to say, and I just, I, I would imagine some of you have heard this too. They would often instruct you and they say, you know, often the very first answer that comes into your mind is the correct answer. And that's proven scientifically. It's proven. Because it's that that happens. It's that something where light comes before reason engages. You know what I mean? It's just that the light, something, God, you hear, you get this impression. We call it impressions as well. That's fine. But it's just, if, and you, you have to learn to really catch yourself because you slip before you slip into too much reason. I mean, I, you know, we, we joke about this, but even offerings, how many of you can remember, you know, like there's a real glow, some, some God's really moving or something like this, and they get up to receive an offering, and they'll say, now, you know, listen to the Holy Spirit and just obey whatever the Holy Spirit says. And how many of you have done this? Well, boom, the first thing I think of is $50. But then my mind goes, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> what about, I've got to buy some groceries, and I'm, what, I won't have lunch with the kids. Uh, <laughs> you know, and I'll put in three, three pounds or $3. What I'm trying to say is, I know that sounds silly, but it's just that a lot, people that, you, old Brother Hagen all those years ago, he used to say, and he would read from all these people, the people that, like when words of knowledge would come, people who responded the quickest always got the greater miracles. And it's, 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 and people miss, often they miss their miracles because they slip into reason and they step away from that initial, that, 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 that flash that came from the Holy Ghost, that's, that, that, because that's how he leads. He is light. It says he's, he illumines the spiritual illumina illumination, the phaneros, the flash of this flash comes. Or, uh, again, led by the spirit, led by pneuma, a, a puff of air, a, a breeze. It wasn't the earthquake. It wasn't the fire. It was, this, it was the still, small voice. It's that, you know. And that's what we have to cultivate, man, over and over and over and over and over again. Anyhow, hallelujah. Now, tongues. <laughs> Honestly, 1 Corinthians 14. Now, uh, God help me, really, seriously. <laughs> ah, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Eagerly pursue, verse 1, 1 Corinthians 14. Of course, the third chapter, of course, the great love chapter, and he's finishing off. Third, verse 13 is where it's so faith, hope, and love abides, and the greatest of these is love. Um, well, there's many things. Anyhow, verse 1, of, eagerly pursue and seek to acquire this love. Make it your aim, your great quest. Uh, that's what one of the verses that stopped me all those years ago, why Rod Anderson 
still teaches the love walk more than anything else. He said, I, loved, I just love the phrase, quest. I love that word. Make it your great quest. And I just wanted to enter into this journey. Make discovering what the real love of God is your great quest. Anyhow. And the King James says, covet earnestly the gifts. And boy, I've been rebuked many times. It says earnestly covet. And I've heard God say, are you earnestly coveting these things? That's what I told you to do. And I have to say, no. I haven't actually earnestly coveted the manifestation of the gifts. And yet we're commanded right here through Paul to um, covet these things. Anyhow, earnestly desire and cultivate the spiritual endowments of the gifts, especially that you may prophesy, interpret the divine will and purpose in inspired preaching and teaching. Verse 2, for one who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not to men but to God. Now, is that what it says? Is that what it says in your Bible? Now, guys, if I had no other verse, <laughs> what I mean is it just flat says when you talk in tongues, you're not talking to men. You're talking to God. Now, tell me. Can talking to God be bad? I mean, it's possibly a pretty, a pretty good thing. So if I had no other reason, it just flat says, when a man speaks in another tongue, he speaks not unto man, but unto God. And then, of course, the wondrous thing that set me lie, but it says what? For no one understands or catches his meaning, because in the Holy Spirit, now the King James says, he speaketh mysteries. That here it says he utters secret truths and hidden things not obvious to the understanding. But I want you to catch this. Like it says in the King James, says when you speak in other tongues, you're speaking mysteries. You're speaking mysteries. Now, again, the language, we don't catch it like it is. The Greek word there for mysteries is spelled M-U-S-T-E-O. It's mustes, M-U-S-T-E-E-O-S. But, you know, when you look it up, it says, I think it's just in W. Vines, it says it means the initiated ones. Like being initiated into a secret society. <laughs> when you speak in an unknown tongue, you're speaking mysteries. You're actually speaking something that initiates something from heaven that becomes earth. Toward, begin, it begins to move toward earth. I, don't miss what I just said. When you're speaking in tongues, you're speaking mysteries. You're, in, you, you're causing an initiation, the beginning of something coming from heaven toward earth. You're paving the way for heaven stuff to come, for the invasion of heaven. Okay? Now, it goes on down, and I know everybody gets caught up about who prophecies and what have you like this. But now, verse 4, he who speaks in a strange tongue edifies and improves himself. Okay? Now, just stop right there. <laughs> um, does anybody in this room need improvement? Or you, have you reached perfection? Like, only Steve that I know has reached perfection. Myself, I have a long way to go. Ask anybody who get close to me. I have a long way to go. He who speaks in a strange tongue, edifying. We know what the word edify means. It means to build up. Julie quoted Jude 20 the other day. And Jude 20 says, building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, rise like an edifice higher and higher and higher. Right? Can you put Jude 20 up? Jude, the 20th verse up? <clears throat> just tell me there for a second. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. I love you anyhow. It's okay. Just get it up. Don't worry. You're in, you're in need. You, you, you have to. You may not go to heaven if you don't get this up quickly. <laughs> I, have, I have close friendships in heaven. But you, beloved, build yourselves up, founded on your most holy faith. Make progress. Uh, you know, I, to me, that's sound like a good idea. I, I can make progress. Rise like an edifice, higher and higher, praying in the Holy Spirit. 
And actually, it is connected to the next verse, which says, and, and guard and keep yourself from the love of God. One of the major ways you can keep yourself from the love of God is by praying in tongues. But anyhow, building yourself up, build yourself, build yourself up, rise like an edifice higher and higher. I remember years ago, you know, because I was, when I got first saved, I got baptized into this thing called intercession. I knew nothing about it. And I was suddenly cast into a place of prayer. And I remember, you've heard me share my first ministry position ever in Vegas. I was hired as an intercessor. I was paid to pray five hours a day, five days a week. And uh, man, did I learn because I didn't know anything. But along the way, the more I prayed in tongues, the more I understood about things. But I remember walking back. I remember that day I was walking back and forth, and I was praying in tongues. And suddenly God just illuminated Jude 20 to me afresh. And again, you know, God will speak to you in a way that will minister to you. That's one thing I love about the Lord. He loves you so much. He'll speak your language for me. He'll speak in a way that you'll understand. But anyhow, he said, building yourself up. And I suddenly saw, and I, and I heard the Lord say this to me. He said, son, every syllable you speak, another tongue is another brick that's building this wall that's building this plan my perfect plan for your life every step you take praying in tongues is one step closer to my perfect plan for your life I remember I boom and I went because it just you know it revealed something you know man you know I, you know, this is the, you know, this is the, but see, hear me, like John 14, John 15, John 16, the last three days of his life, the leadership seminar, he's trying to, guys, it's about the Holy Spirit now. It's about the Holy Spirit now. It's about the Holy Spirit now. And wait till the power of Holy Ghost comes. Wait till the Holy Ghost comes. Wait till the Holy Ghost comes. Wait, don't do anything until the Holy Ghost comes. And what happens? The first thing that happens when the Holy Ghost comes, they all speak in tongues. And again, what do you do with that? It's called the, like the law of first reference, you know. So anyhow, and he goes on. And, uh, and where's the verse? I don't even know where the verse is where he said, I speak. Oh, wait. Now, brethren, no, where, where, I'm sorry. I want to get to the verse. Where it says, I speak in tongues more than you all. Uh, 11? Which one? Okay, I don't even know where it is. But anyhow, it's, <laughs> it's right here somewhere. I'm just missing it because we have, but it says, you know, uh, he said, I, I would that you all pray in tongues. He said, I pray in tongues more than you all. Now, again, you have to ask yourself a question. Again, is Paul sharing the truth or is he exaggerating? And is it a lie or is it, you know, is it actually a spirit-born scripture? I pray in tongues more than you all, but I would rather that you prop them. But the issue is I pray in tongues more than you all. Now, the reason I always stop there is because when I began to actually give myself to studying the Bible, it really began to strike me. You know, the Pauline epistles are two-thirds of the New Testament. Is that correct? The Pauline epistles are where 80% of our Christian doctrine is founded. You hear me? Now think about this. 80% of our Christian foundation doctrine is found in the Pauline epistles. Paul prayed in tongues more than them all. Now, a little bit further, Paul says, when you do pray in unknown tongues, guess what else he tells you to do? He said, pray that you might interpret. Now, again, do you think possibly Paul ever obeyed his own teaching? <laughs> Where did he get that from? He said, pray that you might interpret. So what I'm trying to suggest to you, can you imagine, isn't it funny that God chooses a man that speaks in tongues more than them all, he chooses a man who prays that he interprets to write two-thirds of the New Testament. Did any of you just hear what I said? <laughs> two-thirds of the New Testament, upon which we base 80% of our Christian doctrine, was written by a man who spoke in tongues more than us all, and a man who instructed us to interpret what we pray. Pray that you might interpret. How many of you, you know, if I ask people to actually legitimately raise your hands, first of all, hardly any of us pray in tongues that much. That's the sad truth. And this is the thing that sometimes it freaks me out just because I go, God, you know, God's up there, you know, with a flat spot on his forehead because, you know, he looks down here at the old joke and goes, <laughs> you know, when are my, when are my people going to get it? I mean, I've given, I've given the greatest gift that can ever be given, but they won't cooperate. They don't understand. 
the one who carries, he is the spirit of truth. And he, and he, he gets so big in you that you can't, you have to let it out. And that's where I joke about it, but it is true, you know. Excuse me, my legs are messing up, so I'm sitting here. The stool of blessing is messing me up. <laughs> but um, about this, about praying in tongues is, you know, you have all this, this opportunity to bring this stuff up, but for some reason we don't. Jesus said, and my old joke was this, you know, Jesus said, well, one day I was just sitting in my little office in, in Lane Inn there in England, and one day I'm reading along, and I'm preparing all this stuff because I was teaching all over the place. You know, Julie and I were all over England all over the time and in Europe and back and forth, and I'm studying this stuff, and one day I just, I was going to this where it said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water, and I heard, as, you know, it's my sense of humor, I guess, but I heard, God deals with me like I am. And I heard it as clear as, as, clear as anything. He said, uh, I said, out of your belly should flow rivers of living water. He said, I want to ask you a question. Are you a river or a drip? I remember just laughing because I remember I saw myself that morning get up and go, oh, hallelujah, you know, drip. Sapalabagoda, drip. And I just heard, and it just, this whole understanding, he said, how much life do you think that's going to bring? How much water are you releasing? You want life? I've given you a river. I've given, given you a spring that, that rises up, a fountain that rises up into everlasting life. He said, but you got, see, the thing that you have, you got to let it out of you. You've got to let it out of you. you just got to let it out. And this, I, you know, uh, verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 4, and therefore the person who speaks in an unknown tongue should pray for the power to interpret and explain what he says. Now, and verse 14 is real simple, real clear. He said, I, for if I pray in an unknown spirit, my spirit by the Holy Spirit within me prays. But my mind is unproductive. It bears no fruit and helps anybody. See, that, as, a, as somebody who jumped into intercession, that helped me so much. That I, first of all, I want you to catch it too. When you pray in other tongues, it is not the Holy Spirit praying. It's your spirit being prompted by the Holy Spirit. See, there's this something, this grace of God that's called this, this intersection to happen between divinity and humanity is incredible. And here we get to access all of the truth of heaven. Man, I don't know, but see, that just makes me just, I just feel, go, oh, God Almighty, help me, salabrandi de bawada, sikurita, you know. I really do. I really, really do that. He says, um, my, but I love the fact he says that when I pray in other tongues, my mind is unproductive. And see, that used to help me so much because, like I said, I have this lightning fast mind, and it always gets me into trouble. You know, ring, 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 whip, 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 whip. my mind works, man. But see, I, how many of you have done this? If you ever started say, I'm, if you've ever said to yourself, I'm going to spend a couple of, um, 10 minutes or whatever, spend it praying in tongues. But the moment you start to pray in tongues, your mind starts going, let's see, I need to go to the bank. Um, and I, you know, and butter, 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 you know, and all this stuff. And before you know it, you stop praying in tongues because you get caught up, caught up in your reasoning. And the Lord really had me work and work and work with that verse until I really began. My, my, when I'm praying in tongues, my mind is, un, well, I don't care what I'm thinking. Now you got to be careful. I don't care what I'm thinking. It's unproductive. It's not bearing fruit. Don't, so just don't worry about all the stuff that will come up in your reasoning. And you just, and it helped me finally get past that five-minute mark or the two-minute mark. My God, when you first start praying in tongues, you know, you go for two minutes and you're looking at your watch. And like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Tongues is something that's another language, so it become, you become more and more fluent, don't you? Anybody that's been around, you, you, and you have developed, and, you know, there's so much else to teach. You can, other languages come up. Sometimes I do shift into stuff that sounds absolutely oriental. I mean, I mean, it just, you know, I just, I start laughing at myself. I step outside and I go, you know, one dong ding, one more, whatever <laughs> stuff. You know, I'm going whatever and something like that. And what the heck is that? You know, 
But I mean, and, and I've learned the difference between speaking in tongues and praying in tongues. There's a different level. You can speak in tongues, but then if, you stay, if you're faithful enough speaking in tongues, just like you were talking in tongues, and you stay at it long enough, something happens. The Holy Spirit begins. It's like something shifts gears, and you go from speaking to praying. I mean, it's different, man. You know, about, you know your mother's the, 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 the strength of something comes on you, and you know that something's taking place then when that happens. Anyhow, and Paul goes on to say in verse 15, he says, then what am I to do? I'll pray with my spirit by the Holy Spirit within me, but I'll also pray intelligently with my mind. I will sing with my spirit. Paul sang in the spirit. By the Holy Spirit within me, but I will sing intelligently with my mind and understanding also. Okay. Now, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians 2, and I'm going to finish with this stuff. And again, oh, I'd love to just batter you for about 14 hours and some of this stuff. I, you know, I'm the kind of guy, I always said, God, I, I want to know what's happening when I do this. What's going on when I speak with other tongues? Can I get more information? Again, I can't go through it all because, again, it, it, the Holy Spirit, I want to keep saying this, is the revelator. And like I said, you know, out of your belly will flow rivers, rivers of living water. And so I began to see that, you know, my solutions are right in front of me because the truth is in the air. My solutions right in front of me. But see, all of my reasoning, all of my doubts, all of my concerns, all of the wrong information, it covers up the truth or it, it kind of hides the truth. It's like mud and crud and stuff that's just all over it. But see, as these rivers come forth, it begins to blast away the rock and blast away the mud and blast away the dirt. And see, because revelation, the word revelation, apocalypsis, it doesn't mean something brand new. What it means is something is suddenly seen that's all, always been there. It's always been there, but now something is revealed. And you see what's right in front of you. And this is what's incredible. The answers to all of our questions are in the inside of us, waiting to be revealed by the spirit of truth. But will we yield to the tool that God gave us? Will we press past our flesh? Because I've got to tell you, man, it does take some old-fashioned downtown Christian work. It really does, man. You have to press past your flesh and this stuff. You have to just, because I'm telling you, you, you know, you will pray in tongues for five minutes and you'll stop and go shopping. You know, and you have to get in a place where, you, and I mean, it's, it's something that builds. It, it, you rise like an edifice, it's rising higher and higher. It builds and builds and builds as you continue to give yourself to it. But I asked, I said, God, show me in a way that I'll understand what happens when I pray in tongues. And it's the whole chapter here. But remember, it, and he linked it to me because I kept hearing that verse, when I speak in an unknown tongue, speak not unto man, but unto God. Howbeit in the spirit, he speaketh mysteries, his initiations. And when, I, and when you read 1 Corinthians 2, like I said, this was revelation to me. I saw the words jump up. Well, and I can't read it all. It would take way too much time. Um, but like in verse 4, when Paul says, And my language and my message were not set forth in persuasive, enticing, plausible words of wisdom, but they were set forth in demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power. And God would, he would stop me there all the years ago and he said, listen, Paul's talking about his language. And I, I know what it is in context. But again, this is what the Holy Ghost does. He takes scriptures. I mean, one scripture from heaven can reveal a thousand truths. It really can. But anyhow. Okay. Now, let me just start in verse 6. Father, help me. Verse 6. I got 10 minutes for it. 12 noon. And everybody faints. Paul said... When we are among full-grown, spiritually mature Christians who are ripe in understanding, we do impart a higher wisdom. In other words, this is why when you go to conferences and stuff, if you know people are at a particular level, it determines what you're able to speak and teach off of. Because, you know, God loves us enough. He doesn't want to speak stuff that just flies over our head. Anyhow, so when we're among full-grown, spiritually mature Christians who are ripe in understanding, we're able to impart a higher wisdom, the knowledge of the divine plan previously hidden, mysteries. But it is indeed not a wisdom of the present age or of this world, nor the leaders and rulers of this age who are being brought to nothing and are doomed to pass away, verse 7, but rather what we are setting forth. And I kept seeing the word set forth, set forth, 
about I set, what I set forth in a language. He said, what we're setting forth is a wisdom of God once hidden from the human understanding. Now watch this. The Spirit of God comes to reveal. But rather what we are setting forth is the wisdom of God once hidden from the human understanding and now revealed to us by God that wisdom which God devised and decreed before the ages for what? For our glorification to lift us into the glory of his presence. None of the rulers of this age or world perceived and recognized and understood this. <laughs> For if they had, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. But on the contrary. Now this is one of those verses here that people always quote out of context. I hath not seen and ear hath not heard all that the Lord hath prepared for us. Amen, my brother and sister. Amen. Hallelujah. But on the contrary, as the scripture says, what eye has not seen and ear has not heard and has not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared, made and keeps ready for those who love him, who hold him in affectionate reverence, who promptly obey him out of them. And everybody stops there. I mean, again, in the Amplified, it applied to it. Eye has not seen, ear hath not heard. All that the Lord hath prepared for us. Hallelujah. But the next verse says what? Yet to us. Now, see, I don't know if you're them or us. <laughs> Yet to us, God has unveiled them. Unveiled what? Well, what was in the previous verse? All the things that God has prepared and made ready. See, Steve, by the grace that has happened to his life, has seen stuff that others haven't seen. Uh, I don't know if Victor's here today, one of our guys that's here. Victor, Victor, a uh, couple of them, they went before they came here. They went to the Grand Canyon. They went to Las Vegas, and they drove to the Grand Canyon. And Victor, is that you back there, Victor? Yeah, hey, man, how you doing? Are you still saved? Good, all right. But, you know, Victor's been to the Grand Canyon. I said, what would you think? And he said, I was mad. You know, I thought, <laughs> How did that happen? And you know, I just shared for a minute the Colorado River, brother. said that's what water does to rock, given enough time. You know, water is pretty powerful stuff. But the thing is, nobody can tell Victor now that he hasn't been to the Grand Canyon. You know why? Because he's been there. For him to try to explain to somebody, see, in England, I tried. To, I said, you know, I've been to the Grand Canyon. You can't tell me I haven't. I've been there. But to try to communicate it, to try to explain it, I can say it's a big hole in the ground. <laughs> but I mean, the grandeur of what it is and the immensity of it. And see, this is what I'm just trying to get to here. God has prepared, eyes not seen, ears not heard, all that the Lord has prepared for us. Yet to us, God has unveiled, revealed them. How? How? By and through his spirit. Now, where's the Holy Spirit? Pat your tummy. He has, but yet to us, God has unveiled and revealed them by and through his spirit. Now listen, for the Holy Spirit, I've used this verse a thousand, thousand times. I, I love this statement. The Holy Spirit, the one on the inside of me, searches diligently, exploring and examining everything, even sounding the profound and the bottomless things of God, the divine counsels, the things hidden and beyond man's scrutiny. Hallelujah. In other words, the Holy Ghost, when I cooperate with him and I start this praying in tongue thing and I really begin to practice what it means to interpret it, I mean, he, he searches everything. He knows how to find the exact key to the lock that may be trying to contain you in a place of life that you're at right now. He's... And, but see, he, sir, but again, that wisdom has to get from the outside, I mean, from the inside to the outside. And again, this is, you know, and then one other thing real quickly. People used to always say when you teach the basic teaching on the gifts of the Spirit, when you teach the nine gifts of the Spirit, you always used to say the gifts, the tongues is the least of the gifts. Tongues is the least of all the gifts. Now, I've got to tell you, the Bible says that every single manifestation of the Holy Spirit it manifests as the Holy Spirit wills, right? So in reality, i got to be careful again how I say it. You can't just turn on the gifts of healings when you want to. You can't. 
You can't turn on the word of wisdom. You can't turn on the word, word of knowledge. You can't just turn them on to will. Now, yes, indeed, over from years of faithfulness and stuff, you, can, you become more and more yielded to the gifting that God has given you. But still, hear me, you don't just turn them on. But listen to this. Isn't it interesting that of all the gifts of the Spirit, the gift that is the most easily received, the gift that is the most easily accessible is tongues. Now, you have to ask, is tongues a gift of the Spirit or not? Yeah, well, it is. The most accessible gift of all the gifts of the Spirit is tongues. Now, and I remember sitting back one day, and I said, well, then, really, and I heard God say, you know, people talk all the time about it being the least of the gifts. He said, quite frankly, and I've heard old-timers now, stuff that are read, he said, gifts just may be the most important gift of the Spirit because it's he, God so loves us, he's made it the most easily accessible because it's a gateway. It's a portal. It's what sensitizes you to the rest of the gifts of the Spirit. I mean, they are gifts of the Holy Spirit that's in here. And he, tongues is the Holy Spirit with your spirit. Holy Spirit praying, your spirit praying rather with the Holy Spirit being, you know, prompt in your spirit. And so you're, you're becoming sensitized to the rest of what he has. But, and again, you have to be overwhelmed with the overwhelming love of God to understand how, you know, his eyes running to and fro, this excitement like I spoke about. He wants to manifest himself. But religious spirits kill it. And doubt and unbelief stop it. So anyhow, yet to us God has unveiled these things. Verse 11, for what person perceives, knows, and understands what passes through a man's thoughts except the man's own spirit within him? Just so no one discerns or comes to know and comprehend the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. But again, where's the Spirit of God? He's in you. And then he says, listen to what Paul says in verse 12, now we have not received. This is what he's talking about. Now we have not received, we, now we have not received the Spirit that belongs to the world, but the Holy Spirit who's from God given to us that we might realize and comprehend and appreciate the gifts of divine favor and blessing so freely and lavishly bestowed on us by God. But listen to 13. This is what caught me. And we're setting these truths forth in words, words, but not words taught by human wisdom. <laughs> but words that were taught, Rod Anderson, by the Holy Spirit. Not my words, not the wisdom, not the words I learned in class in English. I, like I said, this was God revealing something to me. It may not work for you. But we're setting these truths, and I just kept hearing this. Rod, he said, when you're, when you're speaking in other tongues, you're setting forth truths. But listen again how it even says it. When we're setting these truths forth in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Holy Spirit, combining and interpreting spiritual truths with spiritual language to those who possess the Holy Spirit. Whatever. But the natural, non-spiritual man, he doesn't accept this stuff or welcome it or admit into his heart the gifts, the teachings, the revelations of the Spirit of God. They're folly, meaningless nonsense. He's incapable, and he's incapable of knowing them, becoming better acquainted with them because they are spiritual. Spiritually discerned. But the spiritual man tries all things. He examines, investigates, inquires into, questions, discerns all things, yet is himself to be put on trial and judged by no man. He can read the meaning of everything, but no one can properly discern or appraise or get an insight into him. Now, verse 16, that's the end, last verse. You know, uh, this is the one that always got me like this because he says, For who has known or understood the mind? the counsels, and the purposes of the Lord. Now listen to this word that he, the Amplified puts in there. So as to instruct him. I mean, who has, who has the counsels and the purposes of the Lord enough to instruct God? Right? I mean, how can man instruct God? But then listen what he finished. But we... <laughs> have the mind of Christ, and we do hold the thoughts and the feelings and the purpose of his heart. See, what we don't understand, it's so heavy. It, you, you see, 
God has done this for us. It's not that God's not, quote, unquote, in control. But see, there's a release that only we can cooperate with. We have the mind of Christ. We hold the thoughts and the purposes of, his heart, of our heart. When you're speaking in other tongues, it's not that you're instructing God and teaching God something he didn't know. But something is flowing out of you that's giving and basically guidance to where it needs to go, where this power needs to go, where the saturation needs to go, so that the life of God that is, is, is his spirit can begin to permeate everything else that's around you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I will absolutely finish with this. You've heard me give this illustration, my story. I don't, I'm not going to read Ezekiel 47, but again, you know. Waters from heaven. Ezekiel's being taken around heaven for like Ezekiel 45, 46, and 47. Remember, he gets in 47 and he said, and my guide took me and the waters were ankle deep. And he took me some more cubits and the water was knee deep. And he took me further and the waters was waist deep. Then he took me further and the waters were deep. Waters to swim in. Hallelujah, right? And then he goes on to talk about that God, you know, he says these were living waters. They proceeded from the temple of God. Right? Now, tell me, are you the temple of God? Yes. And he goes on there in Ezekiel 47, and I don't want to go to it because it takes so long, but it talks about on either side of the river there are trees that bear much fruit. It talks about how these, when these waters enter into the bitter waters, the bitter waters are healed and made fresh. And I just, when I walked through that, I kept seeing, my God, this stuff's in me. And everywhere this water goes, everything shall live. Everywhere this river goes, and I remember walking back and forth. And my old story is, you know, Atascadero down the road? When I was doing prison ministry, one Atascadero, you know, is for the criminally insane. Almost everybody in there is, is, it's a sexual, is in there for some sex uh, problem, you know. And back in that day, I'm talking long ago, you know, the way the world tries to heal people is so weird. They would forgive me, but we're all, almost all adults here. These guys who had raped women and child molesters and all this kind of stuff, you know, almost everybody in there, they have them on, what's that called, uh, pro, pro something, Prozac. I mean, they're just like, oh, they kept them so drugged up. But, I mean, they had this one big, uh, like, a, uh, area that was like an auditorium, and that's where they would bring guys in, and they had some little small things. But they would, one of the ways that they would, quote, try to cure a guy who had a sexual attraction to children is that they would show pictures of children in lesser areas of le not clothed as much. And when the guy would, forgive me, I've got my eyes closed because I hate saying it, but when the guy would get aroused, they would shock him so he would lose his arousal. And then what they would do to heal him, they would show him pictures of adult. They'd show him adult pornography and hopefully allow him to get aroused to that so he would be healed. That's Hallelujah, that's wisdom, right? Oh, God in heaven, you know, the, the stuff I could, the stories I could tell you. But anyhow, so we put in an application to come and do the program. Myself and Fernie Mancia is the head of this prison ministry that we worked with, but it's he and I. I mean, you know, we, did, we visited something like 75, 80% of the major federal and state penitentiaries in America. I did a lot of prison ministry. But anyhow, we're in this place, and I remember we get allowed to come in, and they said nobody's ever had, no Christian group's ever been able to do anything in here, and they really... They said, somebody try, they'll come in, but it's just so, nothing happens. And I always remember this old bald-headed guard as we were setting up, you know. Uh, he said, well, I don't know what you folks think you're going to do. We've had all kinds of groups try to come in here. Nothing's ever happened. Anyhow, let me get to it. Weird stuff started happening. The guitars were set up. Uh, Laura, I always remember Laura Kidwell. She was one of our vocalists because we'd taken a little band with us. And uh, we're just sitting here setting up. Nobody's in here yet. We didn't know if anybody was going to come. They said nobody would come. And all of a sudden, a guitar string goes, bang, and it breaks. Well, you know, guitar strings break once in a while. But as I turned and Fernie turned, two guitars, all of a sudden we watched them on both guitars, dink, 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 dink. They all broke. So we're looking at them. And immediately I thought, something is unusual here. <laughs> See, even people from Bakersfield can have revelation. But I had never been in a place with so much demonic oppression. It was a host, I'm telling you, just a host. 
So anyhow, we're, trying, we're sitting, and I remember Laura, she was sitting there, and she just told him, <gasps> and she just started crying. I mean, just the stuff of oppression, and she just, I don't know, where she was smiling and just talking, and all of a sudden she just broke down crying and little stuff, and one of our other brokenness was the same thing. Anyhow, man, we're finishing. Just before we, they had a, a what they call a recall to release to see if anybody comes, I went to the back, and, I, at, and if you can imagine a wall, Above me were these little holes where the where the projectionists where, where the you know projectors would be. I didn't even notice them. I'm back there and I'm quote trying to pray. Ah, oh, thank you, Father, for this service. Thank you, Father. You know. <sighs> and I'm walking back and forth, and then I just kept stopping. Now you know I couldn't pray, but then suddenly God quickened me. That Ezekiel 47. To me, it's so incredible, you know. Everywhere the river goes, everything will live. And something just kicked me. And I mean, I just took off, man, walked back and and I'm like, everywhere this river goes, everything. And I walked back and forth and walked back and forth and walked back and forth and walked back and forth. Okay, they announced the thing. They called for people to be released. The whole place... People were standing, and you'd have to understand, they're like, like this, and the cops are freaked out because they'd never seen so many people. We ministered, we sang, Bernie gave an altar call, and about everybody came up, and it was my very first experience with actually seeing demons screaming, leaving. It, you know, seriously, one thing about reading about it, but when you're face to face and you hear otherworldly voices and screaming and terror and leaving these people and seeing them suddenly be made sane. I mean, it was incredible. And I always remember the same old bald-headed guard going, well, I ain't never seen, he literally said, I ain't never seen nothing like that. <laughs> Seriously, uh, in Oklahoma accent, whatever, man, cracked me up. I ain't, he just, I ain't never seen anything like this, you know. I, and, uh, but all this stuff, in me, I was, I, it was incredible. They release everybody. Everybody goes back. We're second. We're second. So up. And Fernie, you'd have to know Fernie, Mexican brother, Fernie Manzias. He'd been to prison too, and we'd been in prison together, and we knew each other for a long time. And he said, Rod, Rod, come here, man. I said, what? And he goes, Rod, you know me. I said, yeah. And he goes, I'm not crazy. <laughs> I said, okay. I said, you act nuts sometimes, but no. But he said, no, no. He said, I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy, man. I said, I know. He said, what's up? He said, Rod, i got to tell you, man. He said, you know, just before we, they, all the people started coming in, he said, I was going to talk to you then, but everybody came in. He said, you know when you were back there at the back of the place? I said, yeah. And he said, for some reason, he said, I looked up, man. And he said, I'm not crazy. <laughs> he said, but there was in these three holes up there, these projections. He said, I saw monkeys. I said, what? He said, I saw monkeys. <laughs> okay. But he said, no, man. He said, I saw these things, these little monkeys, they were there. They were like, just like this, making like bouncing. They were bouncing up and down. And it's like they had smiles and stuff. He said, I'm not crazy. <laughs> Correct, man. Now, you know, thing. He said, I'm not crazy, man. I'm not crazy. I saw monkeys. I said, okay, Fernie, what you been smoking? You know what I mean? <laughs> but anyhow, he said, but then he said this. And this is why I love Tom. He said, all, of the, all I know is this, man. He said, suddenly, you, I saw you jerk. All of a sudden, my attention came in. And I saw you jerk, and you started walking back and forth and walking back and forth quick. And he said, suddenly I saw these no, <laughs> I'm not crazy. He said, these monkeys, they jerked. They stopped. And he said, as you kept walking, he said, one by one, these monkeys, they fell on the ground. You didn't, didn't you see them? He said, they fell on the ground, and they ran out the door. <laughs> and I... I, it was so, I remember instantly, I just, God just, something open, everything will live, wherever the river goes. Out of your belly will flow rivers. But we mustn't, don't, don't quench the spirit. Quench, they're all water terms. Let this stuff out. Let this stuff out, that's all I got to say. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for the incredible resurrection truth that is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I thank you, Father. You chose a man who spoke in tongues more than them all. 
to write two-thirds of the New Testament in your book. <laughs> Hallelujah. Two-thirds of the New Testament. You chose a man who spoke in tongues more than them all. God help us see that. What's that mean? Oh, God help us. Father, we give you thanks, Father, for this indescribable gift that is ours, that we can exercise, that we can become more and more fluent with, that will guide us. Jesus said he will teach you all things that the Father has taught me. He will guide you into all truth. He will show you things to come. Father, you don't want us to be caught off guard by surprise. You've given us your spirit to show us and to guide us and to teach us about things to come. Hallelujah. So, Father, I just pray over the church here in Jubilee, these wonderful, 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 wonderful people who love you so much. I'm asking, Father, for a fresh baptism, just like we have read about with Finney and Moody and all these people who said, like, I've had 10,000 fresh baptisms. Let there be a fresh, overwhelming flooding. Let the ocean of God arise in every single believer in this church. I just, can you picture the gushing of the life of God coming out of every believer every Saturday night to prepare the Sunday service? Can you imagine what would happen in our churches, Father, if all, if we let loose this torrent of life? Hallelujah. Life, 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 life flowing out of us by the Spirit of God. I get to pray in tongues anytime I want to. Hallelujah. I get to pray in tongues as much as I want to. Father, help us to release faith, to receive the fruit of the Holy Spirit and receive the truth. He is the Spirit of truth, the truth-giving Spirit. So I could kick us off and we'd pray in tongues probably for the next 40 minutes. But I just want to give you thanks right now, Father. And I do ask again, God, bring revelation of this. Don't let it be a momentary teaching. Let the hearts actually take this on board. And let them understand that we can pray our way out of anything. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I really, I, like I say, I'm not touching fear. I feel God. I mean, I love it. I just, forgive me if you think this is pride, but I feel his approval. No, no, but I, I just mean I feel his approval. I've learned in my life, I've learned that he, when he approves of something I've taught, I approve, I thank you, Father, God. Thank you, Father, for the ocean. Oh, my God, this place is such a giant pool. Lunch from 12 to 1.30, 1.30, come back, and uh, this incredible shining woman named Julie Anderson will minister to you. I kind of like her. God bless.